Well, good evening, everyone. I hope that you had a good Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, so far this week, and that you're ready to get into God's Word. Uh, let me raise this up a little bit. I feel like it's... There we go. Better? Um, this evening, we're actually going to get into the book of Proverbs. We're going to cover an introduction to this book. Um, it's just an excellent, excellent book. I really enjoy it. I try to read... I told you before, I try to read the Psalms as my launching point, but I'll also try to read one proverb as well. And it's kind of neat because there's 31 proverbs, so if you read one a day, you know, you're almost knocking out one a month. And there's 150 Psalms. If you read five a day, then you're also reading the Psalms uh, once per month. So you can read the Psalms and the Proverbs five and one once a month that way. And it's just kind of an interesting way to think about breaking that down. Uh, but anyway, the Proverbs are just excellent. We're going to get into those. Uh, but before we start, uh, let's go ahead and, and have a word of prayer. Um, let me get a volunteer this time because I'm always doing that and forgetting to get volunteers. Herb, would you like to lead us in prayer, please? Dear God, you're an awesome God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word that we can read and study and that we can know what you want us to do. We can know your will and we know your mind that is revealed in these pages. We thank you for our teacher, Brian, who has prepared this lesson. We thank you for the book of Proverbs and all the books we have studied that we can understand, Father, that we can uh, have wisdom and that we can learn from them in our lives and prepare to go to heaven. We thank you for all who have come, Father. We pray we've come with one desire, to worship you, uh, to love you, Father, to study your word and to love one another and that we can eventually reach out to the lost. We pray, Father, you will be with us. Let all, all of our uh, actions and our words praise you and honor you, Father, for you're worthy of all glory and all praise. Be with us as we study. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's ask what Proverbs are, just in general, not necessarily what is the book of Proverbs, but what are Proverbs in general? Proverbs are life lessons expressed in short, pithy state, uh, statements or sayings. Uh, Proverbs help us to navigate day-to-day -day life more smoothly, and the truth is every culture throughout time has had Proverbs of their own because, well, you just come up with these things as you learn lessons in life and you try to encapsulate them in these short sayings. A watch pot never boils. You ever heard that one? Um, anybody else can think of any? Uh, the one in the book was early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. All right. The sayings of Confucius. Okay, yeah, sure. There's collections from other, quote-unquote, wise men, right, from other other cultures, sure. Um, anybody else think of a proverb, just, just a regular? What? Oh, okay, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, very good. Um, there's, there's a Jamaican one. Uh, That's a good one. <laughs> Before you marry, keep your two eyes open. After you marry, shut one. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Be forgiving. Um, the difference, of course, between the Proverbs of cultures and in the book of Proverbs the difference there is that these were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so they provide us with the greatest and the highest form of wisdom and the most timeless collection of life lessons, which also help us honor God, right? So we can talk about a watch pot never boils and maybe some of these other sayings, but those don't necessarily help us honor God. But Proverbs help us honor God because they have his wisdom contained through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, and the book of Proverbs really presents life as a choice between two paths. There's the righteous path and the wicked path. There's no, like, third road. There's no middle road. It's just these two paths. And the righteous path is often considered the wise path. And the wicked is considered the foolish path. And the question is, what road will we travel down in this life? Which path will we take? And the fact that Proverbs are so short and succinct make them memorable so we can easily recall them in tough situations when we are faced with a choice between two paths, which is almost every single day we are forced um, between these two paths in some way. Let's talk about the basic outline of the book of Proverbs. Most of the Proverbs were written by Solomon. In fact, if you look in Proverbs 1 and verse 1, which I totally forgot to turn to earlier. Let me get there. Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, 
king of Israel. So most of these are written by Solomon. Here's the way the book is outlined. Chapters 1 through 9, a father urges his son to seek wisdom. And chapter 10 through 24 is a collection of Solomon's proverbs. So uh, it's interesting, between chapters 1 through 9 and 10 through 24, there's a different layout. Uh, 1 through 9 is a little bit more of a narrative. There's kind of a flow to where he's going with his points in 1 through 9. But then when you get to 20, 10 through 24, and really the rest of the book of Proverbs, they're kind of random. It's not Usually when we study a book of the Bible, it's like, okay, if you want to know what a particular verse means, you need to read the three or four verses before it and the three or four verses after it, and so you can get it in context. Well, it doesn't really work that way with a lot of the Proverbs because they stand alone. And many of the Proverbs have absolutely nothing to do with the proverb before it or the proverb after it. They just kind of stand alone. Some of them do. Some of them are in a bit of a narrative form. But for the most part, in the collections of these Proverbs, they're, they're standalone Proverbs. Uh, chapters 25 to 29, apparently later on, King Hezekiah's men copied down some of Solomon's Proverbs and preserved them in the book. And then the words of Agur, which we, we really don't know much about, who that is. We don't really know much about King Lemuel either, but he records lessons that he learned from his mother in chapter 31. I want to make a couple interesting observations about the outline of this book. First of all, it's bookended by lessons from a father and lessons from a mother. Yes, King Lemuel writes chapter 31, but they're lessons from his mother. I think that's very telling. And I think Perhaps one of the reasons for that is that the greatest, one of the greatest sources of wisdom we have are our parents, our mother and our father, especially if they're teaching us God's wisdom. Learning godly wisdom starts in the home. Our parents have lived longer than we have as children. <laughs> they have learned more lessons about how this life works. And if they're Christians, well, then they've learned much more about how to apply God's word in their life than we have. So there's such an excellent source to learn from at an early age to help set us on the right path for God. But though that sounds obvious, what is the general propensity of young people, especially teenagers, when it comes to listening to their parents? You don't trust don't. anybody over 30. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't trust anyone over 30, yeah. Uh, and I don't know, even, even the 29-year-olds, some of them may view as, as old and outdated, and we don't really need to listen to that. And, and I think there is a propensity among young people to either not want to listen or, if they listen, to do so very reluctantly, almost like their parents are annoying them. But they, you know, here we go. He, they're, my parent, my mom or my dad, they're trying to teach me something again, and I'm annoyed that they're trying to teach me again. Well, it's been so long. Oh, yeah, there you go. They must have forgot what it's like to, to be young, so they don't really know. But, that of course, that's arrogance. That statement does not apply to all young people. No, it does not. No. Yeah, Gener as a general rule, right, there are some young people that they have a great attitude and they want to learn from their parents, and that's great. But I think as a general rule, uh, we struggle. We struggle as young people to learn lessons, and maybe you almost have this attitude like, I can't wait till I grow up, right? So I don't have to listen to my parents anymore, and I can kind of do things my own way. And we think if one day when I have kids, I'm definitely not going to lecture them on this, and I'm not going to tell them to do this or tell them they can't do that. And then what ends up happening is you become a parent, and you, what do you say? I sound just like my parents. Because <laughs> you end up passing down the exact same wisdom that you got from your parents, and even that, of course, is a general statement because not all parents teach their children well, and, and I get that. Um, Proverbs 1, look in verse 8 and 9. He says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Um, this is also a challenge to parents. And I, I'm not a parent, so I'm, I can't relate to this, but... Ask yourself, are we hanging graceful wreaths on the heads of our children? Are we sending our children out with beautiful ornaments around their neck by teaching them wisdom? Some parents don't really um, teach their kids. They kind of let their kids alone to figure everything out on their own. Ah, they'll figure it out, you know. 
Well, yeah, there are some things you just have to figure out on your own. I get that, but you don't want to take that standoffish approach. Some some parents just don't want to put the effort in to teaching their their children, or maybe they they'd rather be their child's friend than their parent, and they know if I start teaching my child that they're going to have that annoyed look on their face and they're not going to like me, and so we don't maybe we don't teach them. Uh, again, I, I'm not a parent, so I, I can't relate to that, but the, but the book of Proverbs shows us godly wisdom needs to start in the home, and it is a beautiful gift to give to your children, even though you may kind of <laughs> have a hard time with giving your child that wisdom because they're not eager to receive it. Um, any, actually, let me make this last point, and then I'll open it up to comments. Another point about this outline. Proverbs 1 through 9 was written mainly from the perspective of a father to a son. And when you understand it's written particularly to a young man, it makes sense that wisdom and folly are personified as women. The father knows that his son is naturally going to be interested in women, that he is going to want to marry and to find a good woman to, to marry at some point. And so... What he does in chapters 1 through 9 is encourage him to choose the right woman. And the right woman for him to choose is Lady Wisdom. And the wrong woman is Lady Folly. Um, a lot of places I could show you this, but look in chapter 1, verse 20. 1, verse 20, Wisdom shouts in the street, she lifts her voice in the square. And then it talks about how she cries out to those who pass by. But then look in chapter 9, chapter 9, verses uh, 13 through 18. Chapter 9, verses 13 through 18, because folly is personified as this adulterous woman who works in the darkness. There's this contrast. Wisdom is this beautiful, this woman who wants to make this man's life wonderful. She wants to bless this man. She wants to help this man um, be all that he can be for the Lord. But then... Folly is this adulterous woman who works in the darkness, and she's hard to resist because she's, she's so beautiful and seductive and alluring, but she only pretends to care about him, when in reality she just wants to use him for her own sexual pleasure or her own earthly gain of, of wealth and then discard him. And what we see in verse 13 is the woman of folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are making their path straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So what the father does at the opening of Proverbs is try to convince his son to choose wisdom instead of folly. And once the son has made that choice by the end of chapter 9, then he's ready to receive all the Proverbs from chapter 10 on. So what's also interesting about this outline is chapter 31 there. It ends with a description of a worthy woman who is, once again, the embodiment of the wisdom that God wants us to choose. It's not just a random description about a good wife, but... The, the ones who arranged the book of Proverbs, which is really a collection or anthology of Proverbs, is trying to leave us with this grand finale, this amazing picture of what Lady Wisdom looks like in the flesh. And the hope is that the young man will not only choose wisdom over folly, but that his life will be overwhelmingly blessed by finding a woman to marry who is wise instead of destroying his life with Lady Folly and evil women. So choose wisdom, not folly. So Proverbs doesn't just tell us what wisdom is. It's designed to persuade us to choose it over folly. That was a lot. Comments or questions about any of that? Chloe? I was going to say, um, when you were talking about how you know, young people won't necessarily listen to their parents or maybe their parents or, the, or won't have their best interest. I think one of the things that could be coming from a kid's perspective is that we're very, I was always very quick to respond, oh, I'll never teach my children like that. But then, you know, I think it's pretty testament to a child's wisdom and um, a, a parent's teaching ability is when that child can then come back and say, I was wrong, and I can now see why you told me to do that. Sure. Because granted, you're not always going to see it right away. It might happen a few the next day, but eventually, I 
know I've said stuff like, oh, I'll never teach my child that, or I'll never do that, and then said, wow, I get why she did that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And ideally, it would be great if we could just, as young people, just learn that lesson now and not have to find out later on in life and not have to come back and apologize in an ideal world. And that's what the book of Proverbs will help us do that. The book of Proverbs will help us to see uh, and discern when our parents, and we'll talk about that in the purpose section, but to discern what, when we really are hearing wisdom. Did I see another hand over here? I thought, Terry? Uh, just speaking of Proverbs, uh, our actions speak louder than words. So I think just regarding kids um, and their respecting us, I think our example of how we respect our parents is, you know, and just be careful of what you say. Well, Grandpa doesn't know what he's talking about. Or when I'm talking to my wife about my parents, you know, I'll forget that. Whereas if we say, you know, Grandpa has a lot of wisdom, or your dad has a lot of wisdom, and you're just saying that, you know, mm-hmm. and watch your grandpa and grandpa and watch your grandpa. Yeah, that's a good point because it's easy maybe to limit this to young people. Right? But in every stage of life, we can have the same attitude. Even as adults, adults have this attitude about God. What does God know? He's just, he's just my heavenly father. He's just my creator. You know, what does he know? And we have that same, we bring that same arrogance to him. So if we can start at a young age to learn to receive wisdom, then when we get older and we, and we grow spiritually, it's going to help us to listen to our heavenly father and to come to, to him with that proper attitude. And that's really the ultimate point that's being made here about listen to your father and mother. The, the, the goal is not, well, do that because your parents know everything in the world and they're just the smartest people ever. No, it's developing a respect for authority and opening your ears to be willing to receive wisdom, to set aside pride, and to hear the truth. Um, Bill. Basically, there are two wisdoms. One is man's wisdom. The other is God's wisdom. Yeah. And if that's so, and I'm sure it is so, who should we listen to? Yeah. The father of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we need to choose God's wisdom over man's. Got to go, Jason. I, I, um, I got to get to the next section. Um, a fool in Proverbs. Let's talk about this. Um, it's hard for us not to think of the word fool as an insult to someone's intelligence. Uh, when we call someone a fool today, it sounds like we're just calling them dumb. But a fool in the Bible is not just about the intellect. It's about the will. Sometimes a fool can be dumb, yes, but sometimes even brilliant people can be fools because they refuse to listen to wisdom. They are too prideful to listen to counsel because they think they have it all figured out. And I'll tell you, you try to correct a fool's behavior, and you try to correct a position that they hold, they're going to freak out on you. They're going to insult you. They're going to think, how dare you? What the audacity that you would have to correct me, to think that you have some advice that can help me grow or that can change me for the better, and they're just going to look down on you and, and hate you. Uh, because they, they're so full of pride. Uh, and ultimately, if you look in Proverbs 1, verse 7, Proverbs 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So since wisdom comes from God and fools despise wisdom, they actually despise God, and they reject His path. And one of the ways that the Proverbs persuade us to choose wisdom is to show us the disastrous consequences of choosing folly. The fool displeases God and faces the consequences both in this life and in the next. And even if they don't face it in this life and it seems like they're kind of getting away with their folly, they will always face the consequences in in the end when they meet God on the day of judgment because by rejecting wisdom, they reject God himself. Let's talk about the purpose of Proverbs. We've already mentioned some general purposes, uh, but the nice thing about Proverbs is it lays out the main purpose of the book right in the opening section. Now, I, I could do it like Waldron did with, with six main purposes, and that, that is kind of how the text reads, but I just, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to do two purposes and with maybe some sub-purposes. Um, but anyway, read uh, one through six. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear 
and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. So really the first purpose we see here in verse 2 is to know wisdom. Proverbs teach us to see things as they really are, to pull back the curtain on reality and to not fall for the disguises and the facades of this world. It teaches us how to exercise good judgment in day-to-day life situations. And it tells us two groups of people that need wisdom. First of all, you have the the young and naive. It's really the same group. It's... uh, to say that a person is naive, it's not necessarily an insult. It just means that they, they don't have the understanding. They're simply ignorant because they, they haven't lived long enough to have learned the lessons of life. And this is, again, why, as young people, we so desperately need the wisdom from our parents because we don't know how to navigate life on our own. You know, our, our kids, your kids may be super smart in school, and so you may not be able to give them much wisdom about algebra, <laughs> but... They need your street smarts. Right? They need your experience. Um, one of my favorite pictures, this was floating around a few years ago, is this one right here. After graduation. <laughs> I mean, I laughed for like 20 minutes because I, I saw this soon after my graduation. And I felt exactly like that. I knew exactly what that felt like. Because here I am, I got all these book smarts, I got my bachelor's degree in business communication, and I, I don't even know how to rent an apartment, I don't know how to buy a car, I don't know how to you know, navigate m- tough moral situations, <laughs> and you just feel so clueless, even though, hey, I have this you know, funny looking cap on, on my head. Because wisdom is about so much more than just book knowledge of you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the other group of people that are helped by wisdom are wise people. That, that may be kind of shocking because we think, well, why do wise people need, need wisdom if they're already wise? Because truly wise people know they have so much more to learn. They know, as it says there in verse um, 5, that they can always increase in learning. They can always increase their, their knowledge. And fools, of course, need wisdom too, but they despise it, so it's not really any benefit, any benefit to them. And one thing that needs to be clear about wisdom, especially in wisdom in the scriptures, is that it's not just about street smarts. That's usually what we mean by wisdom in this world. We talk about shortcuts and you know, get-rich-quick schemes and um, how to get ahead. and That's kind of what we think about wisdom, but wisdom is not just about street smarts, it's about character. It's about character. Um, C.S. Lewis once said this, education, education without values, as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. That's right. That's right. Because wise behavior is about righteous living. And we see that in verse 3. He says, To receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. So true wisdom doesn't just instruct the mind. It also instructs our, our character. It's about navigating daily life, not just smoothly so that everything works out great in our favor, but navigating daily life with integrity and with righteousness in the way that God would want us to handle things. And the second purpose of Proverbs is to discern the sayings of understanding. The truth is, some things in this life sound really wise. Folly, in fact, disguises itself as wisdom. But the book of Proverbs will teach us how to discern between real and fake wisdom, or as Bill was pointing out, man-made wisdom versus godly wisdom. In Proverbs 1 through 9, we'll see that a lot of the things that the adulterous woman and the evil companions say to this young man sound so good. They sound so wise and convincing, almost like they're the obvious choice for this young man. But real wisdom will help the young man see through the deceptive disguise of folly. But again, that starts with the fear of the Lord. The only way we're ever going to be able to discern between true wisdom and false wisdom is when we commit ourselves to serving God and to doing His will. Because then we're going to be on the lookout. When somebody presents wisdom, something that is called wisdom to us, we're going to be on the lookout and we're going to ask, is this really wisdom? And the way we're going to know that is 
does it come from God? And does it help me please God? Chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6 in Proverbs says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Questions or comments about any of that? Jason? I read something today that said a, 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 a goal, or a dream with a date on it is a goal. A goal with uh, steps becomes a plan, and a plan uh, executed becomes a reality. So if our goal is to achieve wisdom, we need to decide when we're going to start. We need to put a, date, put a start date on it. And then we have to decide, well, where am I going to find wisdom? And, and obviously our discussion tonight is that the ultimate wisdom comes from the Creator. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so then what steps are we going to take to achieve that wisdom? And I think that the reason we're so often associated foolishness with the young is because when you're young, you haven't learned that you need wisdom. It sure. is amazing to me how smart my parents are now that I'm almost 50 years old. <laughs> because I'm telling you the truth, when I was 16, they didn't know a darn thing. Of course. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and it's, that, it's that, those stages of development. Now, some people seek wisdom at a younger age. Some people continue to seek folly at an older age. So it, it's not a specific age, but I think that's why we associate it with young. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting to me, Brian, is that the Proverbs are telling, the way you broke down the Proverbs and the description between folly and, and wisdom, one of the things we teach our children or teach others or, or, or need to teach each other or even learn ourselves is what is truly beautiful and what isn't. Mm -hmm. Because when, when, when he's comparing wisdom to, you know, that, that uh, certain type of woman in yeah, beauty. Sure. The beauty is defined in a certain way. So again, God's wisdom is that beauty that we need yeah. to see. Yeah. And, and man's folly is that harlot that we need to avoid. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it, it's not just teaching the, the there's yeah. wisdom about baby wisdom. You know right. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think those are all good points and we'll kind of talk some more about that later when we get to the um, get to the adulterous woman. Um, let me also say this too about discerning the sayings of understanding. Because uh, he makes an interesting point in verse 6. He says, to understand a proverb in a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. It takes work to understand wisdom. I think that's another reason why we need the fear of the Lord. This is another reason why Jesus told parables. They kind of sounded like riddles almost because he wanted people to work for it. And the only way you're going to work for wisdom is if you determine, I want it. I'm going to seek it. It doesn't, yes, it's, it's right out in front of us, but we still have to work for it and we still have to kind of think about it and kind of roll around in our heads. What does that mean? I mean, well, that proverb, I, I just don't understand it. But you roll around in your head and you think about it and you, you have that goal of pleasing God and that's going to help you find that wisdom and understand those, those riddles. Um, let's do, uh, okay, Brenda, and then I'll, we'll move to the next section. Well, I was just going to say, it reminds, some of this is reminding me of the movement in the last few years. It's probably passed on by now, but there was a thing about teaching teenagers what would Jesus do. Mm. You were supposed to memorize that, and I remember they, there was a lot of things that were out there, like you had to, you were supposed to buy a wristband or a necklace that would remind you to think mm. about what would Jesus do. And that, I, we talked about that a little bit with the kids as far as, well, you need to know what he said. Yeah. Well, Jesus is doing what I'm supposed to do on two different things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus being our Lord, he's going to have a different attitude. He has the right to punish. He has the right to, you know, take action in ways that I don't have the right to. Mm -hmm. So um, what you're saying is the right direction and reminds me of that as far as find out what he taught and what he said. And then you'll be able to make the right choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I heard some commentary about that WWJD movement. I'm, I'm not extolling it. I'm just saying. Yeah, no. I, sure, I know what you're saying. Um, one of the uh, criticisms of the WWJD movement um, was that too many people are asking, what would Jesus do, who do not know what did Jesus do? <laughs> and you can't know what Jesus would do if you don't know what he did do. Uh, and so we, we need to make sure that we're getting wisdom straight from God's word if we're going to know what to do. Um, 
All right, well, let's get in chapter one here in terms of the rest of the chapter, because in chapters, whoops, I had to click that, um, verses 10 through 19, he says, stay away from wicked men. Uh, it is so true to life for young men that there are two main sources of temptation for them. One, there's evil women who they are tempted to get involved with sexually. Two, there are evil men who they're tempted to get involved with to go cause trouble and to go you know, commit crime or acts of violence or something to, to gain some personal benefit. And the second one is what he addresses here. So he says in verses 10 through 14, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. And we will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. So there, there's an allure to peer pressure. And, and even think about gangs today, young men joining gangs. because It promises a sense of belonging. It, it involves risk and danger. And it, that's exciting for, for young men a lot of times. And it usually promises some quick reward, like an easy, like easy money. You know, so they don't have to go out and you know, work a nine to five and do it the hard way. Uh, and you can see how wise this plan might sound to someone who is young and naive. But here's the reality, verse 18 and 19. They lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. These men think that they're springing a trap for others to fall into their snare, but in reality they're springing their own trap, which is going to lead to their own demise. Have you ever done any research on you know actual gangs or seen any documentaries um, you know most of those gang members end up killed or in prison you know they they get together with these grand plans of taking over the neighborhood and making some easy money by robbing people or selling drugs but it almost always costs them their life this father is telling his son stay away from these people because they will bring you down with them not have your best interest at heart. Comments on that section? Vanessa? It's just kind of funny to me to hear Solomon, who he is and what he did, the kind of king he was, and the wealth that he had, talking to his son about it. And he's talking about it like when he's a little boy. Mm -hmm. He's about Solomon's kids and what they... I don't know. Sometimes I forget about things like that and how they grew up and oh, well, they had little friends too and they were they had peer pressure too. It was a little bit different, but it was very similar too. And you know, he's not talking to another king and saying don't beat up other nations. He's talking to a little boy about don't go off with your friends and do bad things. And mm -hmm. it's it's just kind of funny to me to hear Solomon saying that and I have to start it. Yeah, and, it, you know, of course, we don't know, ex you know, the exact age of the son that he's talking to here, but, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't there almost maybe be more of a propensity for that child to do what's wrong? Because, hey, my dad's the king. I, you know, I, I can just pull some strings. If I get in trouble, he'll get me out of it. He's, he's the king. Um, but he, he's really, really warning, warning this child, and, and all young people need to heed this warning because peer pressure can be so strong. Um, Later in this chapter, 20 through 33, wisdom cries out to be found. Um, verse, okay, I had that wrong in my notes. Um, okay, let's do verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out at the entrance of the gates in the city. She utters her saying, how long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you, and I will make my words known to you. You know, it's not like God has hidden wisdom from us so that we can't find it. It's right there for the taking. Yet, ironically, so few actually find wisdom. And the book of Proverbs teaches us that the reason so few find wisdom is because they refuse to listen to her. It's not that they haven't heard wisdom shouting to them their whole life through their parents and through their experiences. It's that they don't want it. They would much rather do things their way than God's way. 
young people especially, in their arrogance, think they know better than their old fogey parents or some ancient religion. So when parents give them wisdom, wisdom is crying out to them. It's so obvious. It's in their face. But yet they say, I'm, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do things my way. And so they reject wisdom. And the rest of that chapter is about the consequences that follow from it. And then in chapter 2, he says there's absolutely nothing more important than seeking wisdom. You know, the world is your oyster as a young person. There's so many things to seek. There's so many things to go after. And he says, look, the most important thing is to find wisdom, seek it, treasure it, ask for it. Always have your ears open to it because it will bring you great blessings in this life and ultimately in the next life in pleasing the Lord. And then the rest of the chapter, he mentions those two main sources of temptation again. He talks about wisdom delivering you from the way of the evil men, from the man who speaks perverse things. And remember, in high school, so desperately wanting to be accepted into the cool group. But once, once I got a closer look at their lifestyle, it was amazing to me. They were actually heavily into shoplifting. The cool kids in my, in my school, they, they shoplifted all the time. I, I, just, I never had met anybody that actually did that. And one of them even offered to snag me a pair of jeans if I just told them my size. Now, thankfully, I turned it down, but it's just like, really? Like, that's, that's what you're doing? And on top of the weekly drug abuse and alcohol abuse that I heard about from them as well. But it was amazing just the pull that they had on me simply because they were the, the cool kid. You know, they were the popular kids. And peer pressure can really do that to a young man. And I was not wise as, as a young person. I, I did not grow up, um, you know, with the scriptures. And so I, I, I really had a hard time with that. But real wisdom pulls the curtain back on all that nonsense and helps us see it for what it really is. And then he warns about the evil woman again who flatters him, says, verse 16, to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. She leaves the companion of her youth, forgets the covenant of her God. Her house sinks down to death. Her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. There's nothing that excites a man more than to have a woman think that he is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> when she flatters him and tells him how handsome he is and how much she wants him, it's so hard for a young man to resist that. But real wisdom shows that her flattery is insincere because she just wants to use him and move on to the next guy. She doesn't care about him. She doesn't care about God. And all those who fall for her seduction end up suffering for it and dying spiritually because of it. Real wisdom helps us see past a woman's looks and into her heart, which any young man will tell you is one of the hardest things to do. And of course, that's true in reverse as well for young women needing to discern between an, an evil man as well. But ultimately, it's a parallel with wisdom and folly. And his point is to say, choose wisdom and not folly. Seek wisdom above all else. Two minutes left. Comments or questions from anybody? Roxy. I was thinking that sometimes we have the tendency to seek God's wisdom when things are going smoothly. The moment we hit the wall, we we completely turn, you know, around and we try to seek whatever we think that would be best. And um, you know, even though sometimes we think that God might not be there just because things don't go our way, God is there the whole time. We're just not looking at it. And then we dig our own hole and we're buried and we make mistakes over mistakes over mistakes mm -hmm. until sometimes it's too late. But, you know, it's never too late really to change something and mm -hmm. continue to seek God's wisdom. But I just want to make a point that when everything is so easy, you know, we think, oh, look at God's wisdom, you know, look at, you know, what the scripture is telling us that we are supposed to do in our lives and follow him. But then, you know, something crashes and we discourage ourselves or we think that our way is always better. Than yeah, sure. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes people, you know, they when everything's going well, they take all the credit and say, well, look how wise I am because my life is great. And then they hit you know, this horrible wall, and now, oh, God, get me out of this. You know, please, Lord, help me. You know, I need you now that I'm in the bottom of this pit. I didn't need you when I was, you know, doing well. Uh, so, yeah, we have to guard against both of those extremes and seek God's wisdom at all times. Good thought. Anyone else? I was going to say I have a little bit of a problem with how Solomon was always wise, and it's 
circle that he has, he keeps saying some of these things, that's going to be hard for you. You're probably going to address the things that he's saying. Well, um, just know that they're coming from the Holy Spirit. So, <laughs> just, he, the Holy Spirit uses Solomon, but uh, Solomon, yeah, uh, wasn't that wise all the time with what he did. So, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Read through page uh, 182A for Sunday.